Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, are you wise or are you foolish? Sometimes it's hard to make the differentiation between being wise and foolish. There's a very fine line between one and the other. I thought I was wise. I was shopping about a month ago at a big box store. And I saw a sale for a new K-cup coffee maker. And you know how much I love coffee. I drink four to five eight ounce cups a day. And so I said, I'm gonna buy this. It's $40 off. Except I already have a coffee maker at home. It was acting up a little bit, but why not? I wanted to be wise, be prepared. So I bought it anyway. And then I had to put it in the garage because my wife said, you don't need it. But I kept it in the garage. A week later, my wife is using the coffee maker and it blows up. Hot water was gushing out and splashed on her. It was time for a new coffee maker. I was wise because I had one in the garage. All I needed to do was bring it in, unbox it, rinse it out, fill it with water, and I can have my five cups of coffee. I was wise and I was prepared. And I thought I was wise when I bought all these water filters for my refrigerator. You have to change them out every two, three, four months, depending on how much water you use. I got the generic brand. It was on sale, so I bought a whole bunch. They're in the pantry. I thought I was wise. This week, the refrigerator started acting up again. The ice maker was already kind of broken. It makes ice and you can't turn it off. It will just keep filling and making more and more ice unless you just turn off the switch. And those filters that I bought, they don't quite exactly fit, but it works. But this week, all the lights went out on that front panel. The water would not dispense. The ice would not dispense. You could not reset it. So I did some research and found a solution. They said, unplug it for a few minutes and maybe it will reset. And so I dragged that refrigerator out and I unplugged it. And then I looked at the back of the refrigerator and there was this long patch about three feet long, 10 inches wide, brown color. It was corroding and falling apart. There were bits and pieces of corrosion on the back of the refrigerator. And so I plugged it back in and the panel still doesn't work. And so probably pretty soon, I need a new refrigerator. Now I feel foolish because I have a whole stock and supply of water filters that I can't return. And probably you don't have that exact refrigerator of mine so that I can give it to you. And even if you did, you don't want it because it doesn't quite fit exactly anyway. I thought I was wise but I ended up being foolish. I thought I was preparing, but even in preparation, sometimes we can be foolish. Today we have a gospel lesson, and it talks about being wise and being foolish. We are here in Matthew chapter 25, and once again, we are reminded that this year we've been studying the Gospel of Matthew, trying to get a handle on this Gospel as the Gospel of the year. How we've been able to grasp and understand this Gospel by focusing in on those 
five major teaching sections of Jesus. And you should know them well by now. Section one is Jesus Sermon on the Mount in chapters what? Five, six, and seven. And last week we heard again the Beatitudes. And section two is chapters what? Nine and ten. Jesus reminding us that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Pray to the Lord of harvest to send out more laborers into the field. And then Jesus commissions the disciples to be apostles and sends them out. And in chapter 13, what was that about? The parables. Jesus teaches five or six parables in chapter 13. The parable of the sower, the mustard seed, and so on. And the fourth section was chapter 18, about relationships, restoring relationships, letting your brother know that if they have sinned, you should go and win your brother over. Not to punish them or to be punitive, but to win them back to the Lord, to be able to celebrate together again God's forgiveness, that they can be restored and reconciled to God and to others. And finally, we have come to the end, to the fifth major teaching section here in chapter 25. They call this particular Sunday in the church year, Anti-Penultimate Sunday. It's a fancy way of saying it's the third last Sunday of the church year. And so the end is drawing near. The church year is coming to a close. The calendar year is drawing near as well. The end is near. And the end is near for Jesus. We know as we look at chapter 25 that once again Jesus is with his disciples. And he's teaching them. The very things that are most important because Jesus knows that his end is coming soon. He will be betrayed, beaten, falsely accused, tried, judged. He will be nailed to a cross. He will die and be buried. And he will be risen on the third day. Jesus knows the end is coming. And what does he share with his disciples? He tells them again about heaven. We heard about heaven last week, Revelation 7, that there will be a great multitude that gathers before the Lord, people from every nation, every ethne, every ethnicity shall be gathered in the kingdom of God, people from every nation, every language, and every tribe. And we shall all be dressed in white robes and waving palm branches and singing praises to God. All those who believe in Jesus shall worship the Lord. And there will be great joy. For heaven is that wonderful place where the streets are made of gold. There is no sin, no evil, no illness, no death. But simply the promise of God fulfilled. The presence of Jesus and all believers who trust in the Lord. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's what heaven is like. And so at Jesus' end time, what does he tell the disciples? He tells them a parable about the kingdom of heaven. This is what heaven is like. And he tells a parable about the bridegroom and ten virgins. Many other translations refer to them as the ten bridesmaids. And so those bridesmaids are described as being wise and also being foolish. But before we focus on those ten, focus on the bridegroom. That's who is really important. The bridegroom in this parable is Jesus. He is the one who is coming. And he is coming soon. But in this parable, the bridegroom is delayed. And they don't know when he is coming. 
And so those virgins, those bridesmaids, they're waiting, not knowing when. Very much like our life today. Knowing Jesus will come again, but we don't know exactly when. But why was the bridegroom delayed? There's a man who was getting married. He arrives in a limousine. He's dressed in Mid-Eastern clothing. So people around him knew that he was from that region and that he was attending this banquet. He gets out of that limousine and the banquet hall is simply about 200 feet inside the building. But as he gets out of the limousine, he walks kind of funny. He makes his way toward that banquet hall by walking very slowly, inch by inch, which is really kind of strange. And then he would stop and he would talk to people. And he would do this, walking slowly, pausing, looking around, talking to people. And he did this for two whole hours before finally making his way that 200 feet into the banquet hall. And why was he doing that? Why was he delaying? Because there was a dowry involved. And he did not want to give the impression of being overly eager about that dowry, whether he was receiving or whether he was giving it. He wanted to make sure that in their culture, it was respected and that it was about the relationship and not the dowry. And so in this parable, Jesus is delaying and it is not about the gifts of heaven and eternal life. He's saying it's about the relationship. It is to recognize the relationships with people being the most important. Those ten virgins, those bridesmaids were to usher in that bridegroom. It was a great celebration. It was going to be one big banquet, one great feast. It was going to be a great celebration. And when that time arrived, they cried out at midnight, the bridegroom is here. And so the five wise Bridesmaids, they trimmed their lamps. In other words, they lit them up. They burned with oil. And they were wise because they brought extra oil. But the five who were considered foolish, they did not bring enough oil. And when they asked for some oil, they were told to go and buy your own. And so they left. And in, in the meantime, they all went in to celebrate. And when those foolish bridesmaids came back, the door was already shut. And they said, Lord, Lord, open for us. But the Lord said, I do not know you. And Jesus ends the parable by saying, watch, therefore, for you do not know the day or the hour. What made those five Wise bridesmaids, wise? Because they were prepared. They were prepared spiritually. The oil was a symbol of life. And those five bridesmaids prepared for that which was most important. And so we can think about that. How can we be prepared? How can we live wisely? Being prepared for the coming of the Lord. You're doing it right now. Gathering as God's children to celebrate the word and the sacraments, to embrace God in worship. We prepare our hearts spiritually through our prayers, through loving God and loving one another. And when we love others, that's how we also reach out 
to share the gospel with others. We can practice our spiritual disciplines that we've learned. Silence, solitude, compassion, accountability, mercy, and so on. Those are the spiritual disciplines. Those are the ways in which we can prepare in great anticipation of the coming of the Lord. And if you are foolish, it's not that you don't prepare. Those five foolish bridesmaids, they came with their lamps, but it was not sufficient. They were very nonchalant about the affair. They were very matter of fact about things. They did not take it as a priority for their lives. Yes, they were at the event, but it was not something that they anticipated. They were waiting, but not with great joy. It was just going through the motions. And that's how we can be affected as well. If we are living foolishly, we take our life in our faith as a matter of fact. We go through the motions and we fail to love the Lord or to love others. We take things of spiritual importance and say, I'll get to it later. I have enough for now. And so that's the danger for us when we live foolishly, taking things for granted. And that day will come when Jesus will return and he will be announced. And we want to be those who are living wisely, well prepared. For we know our Lord desires that. He desires to bless us. He desires no one to be left out. He desires no one have the door closed on them. But he also reminds us, live wisely. Live under my grace. Live according to my promises. We oftentimes think that maybe Jesus will come back in my lifetime. Or maybe Jesus will come back in a thousand years. And that's a long time and a long way off. Another way we can think about that is that Jesus' return will be at the end of our life. For the day we pass, instantly we are in heaven. There is no time gap. And so that return of the Lord, we don't know the time or day, but we know that it is soon. And so we take great comfort in knowing that the Lord returns. He will call us into his heavenly kingdom, that we will be blessed with all of his grace and promises in our lives. In the name of Jesus, by his power and for his glory, amen. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, God save your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.